All right. Well, we're going to get started. And this is going to be a bit of a challenge for us as we struggle through this technology as we learn how to do all hybrid events. So um, bear with us and I appreciate everybody's patience. Um, all right. So we're going to start. I guess I will introduce myself and say hello to everyone. My name is Nanya Wenger and um, I am the Community Coalitions Manager here at 180. Um, and I want to take just a minute to talk uh, before we get into the meat of things this evening. I want to talk a little bit about 180. For those of you that don't know, uh, we're located in Worcester and we um, offer kind of our core services. What we uh, mainly focus on are addiction and substance use disorder services. That's not all we do, but um, we offer outpatient and residential treatments. Uh, we have a new uh, partial hospitalization program that we've just started. Uh, we have uh, medical services. We offer peer recovery services, which you're going to hear a lot about tonight. Um, we offer mental health counseling, uh, supportive services, domestic violence and sexual assault services, housing and supportive services, and of course, community relations and prevention things that uh, that's the department I work in. So um, we want to say thank you to the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, uh, Mental Health and Recovery Board of Wayne and Holmes County. And um, that's how we're able to do the things that, that we're doing, like this, these education sessions um, we wouldn't be possible without the support of those partners and the um, availability that they uh, give us to interact with our community and help uh, hopefully provide some good information. Um, so just a couple of things real quick. <clears throat> Some of the things we may talk about tonight may be a challenge to hear. Um, they may be, you know, sore subjects. Um, I would encourage you to please take whatever space you need to for self-care. Um, you know, take a minute and walk away if some of this is is a little hard to hear. Um, come back when you're able to. Um, ask questions. Um, you know, put things in the chat that we can discuss, especially if it's something that is exceptionally challenging. Um, if you're able to share that with us, then we're maybe able to offer up some solutions or some support um, to help maybe get through some of the tougher parts of some of the subjects that we may end up hitting on this evening. So uh, again, use our chat. We'd love to hear um, questions and hear from you as we go through the presentation. Um, I would ask for uh, Dwight, I know you can hear me. So if you can help monitor that chat, that would be extremely helpful because I won't be able to see what's happening in there. Um, feel free to uh, stop us if a question comes through. I'd rather answer questions in the moment so that we kind of know what the conversation was instead of waiting until the end because then we may you know, lose track or, or not be able to go back to that thread and uh, give a nice, good, clear answer for somebody. So let us know if those questions pop up so we can work through those. Um, okay, so that is everything I have for housekeeping right now. I want to talk just a little bit about how we, how and why we started doing these education series uh, that we're in the middle of. So um, let's see. August 31st was recognized as Overdose Awareness Day. And that was the first of um, this three-part series. Uh, it started with Dr. Labor doing a presentation, her Addiction 101, um, you know, to really kind of draw attention to uh, what's happening as far as overdoses. Everything's been um, a challenge, obviously, because of the COVID world that we live in now. Um, but we don't want to lose sight of those recognition, recognition of the things that, you know, our communities are still struggling with. You know, overdose is still something that's happening, and we're actually seeing an increase. If you guys can see the statistics that are on the screen right now, uh, the very, very dark purple was um, 2017, that magenta color was 2018, the green is 2019, and the gray is 2020. And there's some good things and some bad things that we can see just from these numbers. Maybe not bad things, maybe that's not a great word to use. But we here in Wayne County have actually managed to bring our overdose numbers down, right? Um, and that is absolutely a good thing. We are actually in better shape sometimes than the state averages for these things. That's really, really encouraging. Um, it doesn't mean that we're done fighting and everything's fine now and we can just kind of forget about these things. It just means that we need to maintain what we're doing now to help keep these numbers as low as possible. 
Um, one of the more challenging things that we see in this is that those numbers have started to kind of creep back up again. Uh, we had a good dip in 2018, 2019, they went up again. Um, 2020, they're kind of in that middle, you know, kind of middle range of that big decrease that we had. So uh, we'll have more numbers soon and we'll keep looking at those. But, um, you know, just so that we don't lose sight of the fact that, you know, that's what started this and that's what started this series. We want to make sure that we're acknowledging the other struggles that are happening in our community as well. So um, let's see, what else do we want to talk about before we move on? There is another statistic here. Let me move us forward. Um, again, uh, this is... I, I should have said the last was overdoses that needed emergency department interaction. I should have clarified that. I'm sorry. This one is actually overdose deaths by year. Um, so this one's definitely kind of that challenge to, to look at. You know, we know that these numbers represent individuals that lost a battle um, that a lot of the people here that are going to be talking tonight have fought. Um, so again, 2017, 18, 19, and 2000. Uh, 2017 was kind of a peak. We then managed in 2019 to cut that number more than in half of overdose deaths. Uh, we can definitely thank Narcan and some other tools that we now have at our disposal helping to bring those numbers down. Um, but again, in this COVID world that we live in, we see that you know some these things are becoming a challenge again for some folks and our overdose death rate has climbed again. So, um, not a fight that we're done with and um, definitely things that we need to be considering as we consider all of the other challenges that our communities are faced with right now. So um, we can do better. And I think this graph shows that we can make a difference and the things that we do in our community um, matter when it comes to prevention and treatment and peer recovery. And all of these things are definitely tools that work when we're able to get out there and utilize them. So the positive things to those numbers are there as well. Um, let me move on here. So uh, as we finished with August, we moved into September. September is um, Suicide Awareness Month. That's closely related to some of those statistics. We don't always know if an overdose was meant to be a suicide. Um, but we do know that there's hope and hold on. Uh, hold on, there is hope, reach out. So if anybody needs to write these numbers down, I'll leave them up for just a minute. These are resources. We hope that tonight's gonna to be full of a lot of resources for folks. So um, if you need those numbers um, or that information, it's there for you. And the other thing about September is it is recovery month. Um, and that's what we're gonna to celebrate today. So Let's move on here. Bear with me. I'm working on a different system that makes it a little hard to follow through here. There we go. Okay, we must recognize that addiction is not a moral failing. It is a chronic illness that must be treated with skill, urgency, and compassion. The 19th U.S. Surgeon General facing addiction in America. Um, hopefully, we have lots of conversations uh, about what we're able to do to help this chronic illness uh, this evening. So we are going to start our second event in a three-part series. Uh, the first one was, again, Dr. Labor and her Addiction 101. Today, we're going to talk about supports, supports for the family, supports for people in recovery, um, just lots of different uh, avenues for people to take when they need um, support, whether they're the one that's struggling with the disease or maybe a family member or a child or, um, you know, whoever this disease may be affecting, there are things out there that can help. Um, I do want to recognize that we do have a third event in this series coming up on the 30th, and there'll be a flyer up for that here in just a little bit that you folks can take a look at. We'll be advertising on our social media and website. Please keep an eye out for um, all that good information coming to us virtually. Oh, there's the save the date, September 30th, and that is on our website and on our Facebooks. So, uh, Dr. Labor, we're going to start off with a message from her after her Addiction 101 uh, last month. She recorded a small video to get us started today. Here are Dr. Labor's um, 
what I want to say, credentials. I'm not going to read them all because we, most of us <laughs> know that she is very qualified to do the work she does. And that's one of the reasons that we're so happy to have her here, have her here at 180. So hopefully I can make this work. Let's see. Oh boy. Dwight, I'm going to stop this. Do you want to pull up your version and see if we can get it to play to play from your end since I'm not able to get the volume up on, over here? Yes, I will in just a second here. Okay, great. Well, while you're doing that, uh, we'll talk a little bit about these 10 gu guiding principles to recovery. And I'm sure our, our uh, peer recovery folks will touch on a lot of these. Um, SAMHSA has put out these 10 things that are definitely, um, can definitely help somebody <clears throat> along their path. Um, you know, hope, just having hope that there is something on the other side. Um, you know, person driven, understanding that we need to make those good connections with people. Uh, I've heard it said that um, recovery is, is not something we can do alone, right? We've got to have people there to support us um, in, in that path. I guess this will be a good time maybe for me to talk a little bit about the fact that um, recovery is definitely something near and dear to me. I am a person in long-term recovery. I have been blessed with a job that means I get to go out and help educate people and work in the community instead of uh, doing what our peer recovery folks do because they've got a, a really hard job and I'm grateful for them because I don't know that even enjoying recovery as much as I do that I'd be able to um, support the folks like our peer recovery coaches do. They do such a good job for our folks. Um, let me see, Dwight, should I stop sharing so that you can get in there? I should be able to share here. It'll stop you automatically. So let's see. Here we go. Did it pull up her bio? It's coming up. Yep. You've got it, Dwight. You're good. Okay. So I've so I've talked about addiction or substance use disorder and what that means for the individual who suffers from it, but I, today we're going to talk about um, what that means for a family member or a supportive uh, friend or uh, someone who deals with people who have substance use disorder and what they should do or what you should do um, if you are uh, in that situation. And really what it comes down to is that each individual, each family member needs to take care of themselves first, right? Nobody is gonna fix somebody who has substance use disorder. You're not gonna change them. You're not going to save them. But what we can do is take care of ourselves one step at a time. And what that does is number one, puts us in a great position to be able to deal with the unpleasant situation of addiction. Um, and it also helps uh, each individual um, uh, get to the next stage of their own recovery and, and be able to manage uh, all the stress that comes along with having a family member with substance use disorder. So the presenters today will talk about what resources there are to do that and how a family member can um, access those resources and uh, do what they need to do in order to focus on themselves instead of on the addiction, which certainly gets enough attention as it is. All right, perfect. So I am just now going to ask uh, Sam to start us off. And if you'll please introduce yourself and um, let us know uh, if you have something specific that you can add to Dr. Labor's uh, comments there about some of the supports that are available out there. You gotta unmute him. He, yep. There you go. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, it's, a, it's a privilege to be here this afternoon. A um, little bit about me. Um, I was uh, hired at 180 in May of 2018. I'm also a person in long-term recovery. I was hired in as a, a recovery housing recovery coach. 
to work with our clients in our recovery housing program. At that time, there were five of us uh, recovery coaches here, and we had five recovery homes. Um, now our staff is more than doubled, and we ha we're, we currently have seven um, certified recovery homes and a couple transitional recovery houses that, that we manage. Um, I was promoted to oversee the peer support staff and in October of 2018, and also our, our, I manage our recovery housing program and um, take care of all their help. I have staff and, and myself that take care of all of the uh, residents that uh, love to stay with us. They, they love our program. They really do. We've had people repeat, which I think, you know, they, they come in and left for one reason or another and then have asked to come back and then stay, um, stay with us for a while. So I think that speaks volumes about the, uh, the way we manage our recovery housing program and just the character and integrity that we work so hard to maintain in our program. Um, getting to what Dr. Labor was talking about, if you do have a, a loved one um, suffering from uh, substance abuse disorder and an active addiction, I agree with her. It's very important for you to take care of yourself and set boundaries uh, with um, your loved one. Um, I'm sure many of you know that, um, you know, some people may experience, you know, their loved one stealing from them, lying to them. Um, a, a host of other things, and and remember, it's it's not really it's not their lack of moral integrity that that slide um, said earlier. It's just they're sick, and uh, that's what we're here for. We're here to help them um, overcome obstacles to um, recovery, and help them stay focused on uh, what to do and not to do in recovery. They don't some some people in early recovery really don't like what we have to tell them. Uh, or suggest to them, like, uh, for instance, um, you know, I was given recovery old school. I had no relationships, intimate relationships for the first year. The majority of the of our people that we work with don't want to hear that. And sometimes they they pay a hefty price for that in, in forms of relapse. And we've lost a couple people um, to overdose um, because they don't stay focused. On, on what we suggest to them, and that's a tragedy. So um, I, I, I just wish you could, we could uh, magically implant it in them and that they would all get it and everybody could live happily ever after, but unfortunately that's not the case. Um, we, my, me and my staff work very hard um, um, to do as much outreach in the community in Worcester and Wayne County and Holmes County as we can uh, we work with the homeless population, and uh, I go to the breakfast church every Thursday with a, a housing case manager, and she reaches out to their homeless um, problems, and I ask people if they suffer from addiction-related issues, and I try to help uh, help with that. So together, we make a pretty good team. Um, I have a staff member who's with us tonight, Drew, that goes to uh, detox and follows up with people that end up in detox. I have a staff member that does outreach in Wayne County Jail. Uh, so we, we try to reach all areas of populations in Wayne County that, that may have people suffering from addiction issues. And we do our best to help them. And uh, I, I'm just glad to be part of the 180 team. I, th I think they that the agency as a whole does a great service to our community. Thank you. Thanks, Sam, very much. We'll probably hear from you again. Feel free to chime in later. We've got lots more to talk about. Uh, Jill, if you're ready, I'd love to. We'd love to hear from you. Okay. Hi, I'm Jill Adams. Um, I've worked here at 180 um, since March of 2019. I am um, the recovery coach team leader, and I'm also the evaluation and outreach coordinator. Um, I, I wear a couple of hats here at 180, um, but one of the things I do that's really important is I um, do what is called a QRT, which is the quick response team. Um, I go out with a sheriff on a weekly basis and meet with um, individuals or try to get in touch with individuals and their families um, who have recently overdosed. Um, in doing that, I do get to talk a lot to a lot of family members um, and provide them with uh, some 
resources of places that they can get help for themselves. Um, so for a person or people who are dealing with an addict in their family or a friend, loved one, um, in any case, I think one of the most important things you can do for yourself is to educate yourself on the disease of addiction. Um, I think that uh, one, of, one of the ways that I try to educate um, my family members and my loved ones is um, also other people I come in contact with in the communities. I've gifted uh, Dr. Labor's book. Uh, that it's a really good book that uh, can kind of like break down what the disease of addiction looks like. So um, I've also, done, you know, I've given that to my doctor, you know, um, so that's one way. Uh, another way is um, in Alcoholics Anonymous, we have um, something called the big book, which is kind of like, um, like it's like the Bible of the 12 step program. And in there, there are a couple chapters that are directed to the family members and to employers, to wives um, or husbands. It, um, it was wrote a long time ago. So it really just says to the wives, but it's really for significant others. Um, so that's a good way you can uh, educate yourself about addiction. Uh, there's resources online. Um, a lot of agencies have support groups. I know that we do uh, for families that are dealing with the loved one in addiction. Um, it is important to take care of yourself, but it's also important to understand um, what's going on with the addict, um, that it is a disease and that um, like Dr. Labor said, there's nothing you can do to um, you're just not in control of that person or that situation. And so it really is up to them to, to do what they need to do to get better. Um, you can't take what is happening personally. Um, and I know that that's really hard to do because I know it affects you in a personal way, but um, you're not responsible for what is happening. Um, but you can find ways to be supportive. Uh, you can talk to your loved one um, either, you know, if you can, you can have a conversation with them, but maybe if that's not okay, maybe if you have a professional help you, um, you can discuss things that are triggering. Uh, we don't always realize that watching certain TV shows can be tri triggering for somebody or just arguing in general and having a lot of tenseness in the house can be very triggering. Um, so, you know, we just, you know, it's best to kind of look into those things. Um, my friend Drew here, he's going to share um, about Al-Anon. Um, that is a very good resource also. So, and uh, as they say in AA, with that, I pass. <laughs> Great, Jill. Thanks. Drew? Okay. I'm uh, Drew Sherwood. I actually went through <clears throat> 180 for services in 2019. Um, through residential and then recovery housing, and now it's went full circle. Um, I'm also a person in long-term recovery. So some of the tools that I've used along the way, because I still have family members and or friends that are out there and, and um, still qualifying, so to speak, is they're still in active addiction, um, is uh, I had a counselor suggest to go to Al-Anon, and check it out and see what they do to cope with it and their support system. So I've been to Al-Anon probably a handful of times and um, they've shown me like, they talk about the hula hoop and how like, you can only control what's in that. And um, some of the things that like, they just, they help each other see it through another person's eyes who's been there and just a support network of like, you're not alone during this whole process of going through, especially if you're just now figuring out or somebody may just now be becoming an alcoholic or an addict in a sense of they're just now, it's starting to spiral. Um, so some of the things uh, also that have been very helpful. Okay, so I, I have some websites too. Um, so if you're looking for an Al-Anon meeting in your area, and that would be for alcoholics, um, would be um, al-anon.org. And then there's also, um, there's one for narcotics as well, and that would be naranon.org. I tried finding one. Okay, so nar anonorg I tried finding one for... Um, like heroin and not like um, like an Al-Anon for heroin addicts, and it's still really developmental. And I haven't 
I couldn't find the website if there is one. So I know that just recently started about one or two years ago. So, um, Drew, can you go back and tell me the Al Anon site again? I'm going to put that in the chat for folks. What was that yeah, Al Anon site? Um, it's a l dash a n o n dot org. Great, thank you. You're welcome. And then, um, so some of the things that have, have also helped um, in dealing with this, and I've just started recently, is um, reading a book called Codependent No More. And I didn't realize how codependent I was on other people and how sometimes that can be very toxic and I feel I'm helping somebody who's out there in active addiction and really I'm like I'm, I'm doing maybe the worst thing for them. I know for me personally the the best thing my family did for me was show me that tough love of like you know when they kicked me out of their house and I was homeless for a little bit you know um, some of those things really made the biggest impact. I didn't appreciate it at the time that's for sure. But I really did afterwards um, that they they did the best thing for me. Um, it was tough for them to have a front row seat, you know, to my, my um, to me slowly decaying and dying, you know. Um, so like codependency, it, I'm, I'm reading this book and it, it's just amazing. Um, it's really taught me like how the, the family member gets just as sick as the person that's out there um, in active alcoholism or addiction and how like they need a support network as well because what happens sometimes is that person gets well and we're still sick in a sense. So um, there needs to be some kind of way of, you know, I, I didn't really ever know how to take care of myself. I was so busy worried about taking care of others um, that were out there and um, I got in this really dark place and uh, I, I found I really couldn't do too much for, you know, those people that were still out there. So I had to create a distance and um, I don't know, one of those people is sober today and that's really awesome to see. They've been sober over a year. Um, but so I, I would say that's about all I have for different resources or anything. Um, and if you have any questions, I can definitely expand on some of them, but yep, I'll pass. Great, Drew. Thank you. So I'm going to launch one of our uh, one of our polls here. Up, oh, it's not going to let me. Uh, Dwight, will you see if you can launch a poll? It says we're logged in on another device. So I think you might be able to launch it from your end. I, I cannot. I, I it was not there either for me. Okay, well, we may not be able to launch our polls at all. So let's just, um, <clears throat> so there were a couple of things that you all said that I want to take a minute just to kind of highlight. Um, I really appreciate this idea that there's so many different ways that we can try to meet some of our folks where they're at, right? And that's really, really supportive. When we talk about ways to support um, people that are struggling with the disease, if we're able to come meet them where they're at, instead of demanding that they be able to come to us, that can really move things along, you know, to helping them find a good space that they're able to, to want to ask for help. And, and, you know, they feel like we've connected with them um, when we're able to go out and kind of meet them where they're at, whether that be at the shelter or at the community meal or at the, you know, some of the darkest places of, of these folks' lives, you know, the jail, the the detox. And, um, you know, that's, a, that's something that um, I'm a member of a 12-step fellowship, and that's one of the best things about it is that I get to have those conversations with somebody that understands because there's some things that I'll say about how my disease affected my life. And if I say that to somebody that has, doesn't have that lived experience, I can get some really strange looks sometimes, right? Like, how's that kind of thing? But if I say that to somebody that's lived it, they go, oh, yeah, I know. I remember, you know, my life was exactly like that. Or this happened like that for me. So, you know, I think, I think that that's one of the main things that when we talk about what a peer support person can do. That's one of the biggest aspects of that. Um, <clears throat> so what was the other thing I was thinking about that we were talking? Um, so we talked a lot about support for families, like here's an Al-Anon resource. You know, we've talked about 12-step fellowships a little bit. 
So I'd love to hear just a little bit from each of you about some of the things you specifically do to support the people that you work with. Um, I think obviously we already know that there's a, a listening ear there. That's always kind of a given when we interact with folks or when you guys get those chances to interact with folks. But if you could give us just a couple of examples of maybe some things that you specifically do to help support those people while you're working with them. I'll call on you if, if I need to, but anybody can chime in whenever they want to. <laughs> okay, I'll start us off. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Sam. I don't get to work directly with clients anymore as much as I'd like to. Um, I really miss that. Uh, however, I'm, my, I'm available to my staff for any time that they have um, a crisis that arises with, with one of their clients. Um, I've gotten a call. I've been in my office and got a call from a staff member that one of our clients uh, was in distress and um, was highly intoxicated and was just having a mental, a really bad mental health episode. And I, I got up, it was 6.30 in the morning. I got up out of my chair and went to his apartment and talked to him. And uh, he, he was in bad shape. He really was, he was in bad shape. Um, I called a squad on the way down there and they, they sent the cops first and he wanted to fight the police. So I, t I actually talked him down out of that and um, he listened to me. So I, I, you know, I was able to connect with him. He knew me. So, you know, I, I enjoy doing things like that. I know they can get kind of uh, heated or dangerous sometimes, but, but those are the kind of services that I um, and, and my staff provide to our clients. Um, and I've had several staff members go the extra mile. My, my whole staff goes the extra mile really. They really do. They're they're very hardworking, and they have our clients' best interests at heart. And sometimes the clients don't think that, but but they do. They they really do. And um, we do our best to to uh, to relay them to them how we were given recovery, how how it worked for us, and offer them some just suggestions, like I was talking about earlier. And um, it's just nice for me. It's very rewarding when I get to see somebody get it, okay? It's just like a, a, a switch flips on and you know they didn't get it yesterday, they didn't get it last week, but today they got it and they stay sober and they and they work on, on making their life better and cleaning up some of the wreckage that they caused and making their relationships with family members better. And, and it's really heartwarming to see things like that. So I pass. Yeah, we're using a lot of AA language in here because uh, I also am in recovery. And um, so when uh, I know Nanya had mentioned uh, having that listening ear, but it's also how you have that listening ear and how you talk to people. Um, I, we really encourage people. And one of the things that we encourage is to go to 12-step meetings. Um, and when you're somebody who is early in recovery, it can be very intimidating to walk into your first AA meeting. Um, you walk into a meeting where there uh, is a, you know, there can be a few people and there can be like 30, 40, 50 people in a meeting. Um, and everybody, for the most part, is happy. And, you know, they're all in recovery. And, and, and you know, so you're kind of this outsider. Um, not that anybody in that meeting would not just love to give you a hug and embrace you and bring you into the fellowship. Um, but that's not exactly how you feel when you first walk in here. So one of the things that we encourage and one of the things we do as peer support is we will take people to meetings and um, just kind of be that person to not only walk in there with them, but also introduce them to other sober support, um, help them, you know, talk, uh, you know, to, you know, the people around them and just kind of encourage them through that. Uh, so that's one of the important things that we provide. Um, we also, um, we also get that, that they, um, what their struggle is because we ourselves have lived experience in um, getting sober and, you know, getting it, you know, you know, going through recovery. And although, you know, everybody's journey in recovery looks different, um, there are a lot of things that we have in common. And so we try to relate to their story and try to relate our story to them, 
to them. So that's, that's one of the things we do that's important. Um, also, like I discussed earlier, just knowing an a person's triggers and kind of explain to them how you dealt with those triggers and what coping skills that you utilized when you were going through, you know, your recovery. So, um, I mean, there's a lot of things and I, and I also want to encourage, um, education and, and just learning about the disease of addiction. I cannot encourage that enough. So I passed you drew. <laughs> Thanks Jill. <clears throat> Jill. Okay. Um, some of the things that are great that we get to help our clients with is like whatever their peer driven goals are, like they come up with their own goals and we try to figure out how to get them to where they want to go in life. Um, some people don't really have an idea. We have a nice like little starter sheet of different like a peer needs assessment and uh, we start there and um, different things that they may want to accomplish. Some are short term, some are like mid, some are long term. And we break those down into like smaller chunks of achievable, you know, um, like how to eat about uh, an elephant, you know, one bite at a time. So what we do is like, what can you do to this day or this week? And like, so I used to have a peer supporter and, um, I felt, <laughs> I felt so guilty if I didn't complete the goal I had for that week by the following week. So I would try to do it as fast as I could sometimes and, and get it. And, uh, you know, it felt good to come in there and like, you know, ready for that next part of, uh, what we worked on was a lot of budgeting. So, you know, um, I, I didn't know how, I didn't know how to, save money, pay bills, who I owed what when I came into recovery. Um, so help me figure out, you know, how to do those kind of things. Those, those things that I, I don't know, I just never developed. Um, so some of the other things too, like in, in my position of like meeting with people at the hospital, some people are very resistant to change. And, um, Sometimes you just have to meet them where they're at and like, uh, they'll be like, I'm just going to work a lot and I'm going to keep myself busy and that's going to keep me sober. And, you know, sometimes I'll challenge them if, you know, you, if you feel they're ready, um, sometimes it's like, okay, you know, you can tell when somebody has their mind made up and they're already going to do no matter what you say or weigh in on. So some of those people, unfortunately, I'll see in a few weeks, you know, they'll end up back there, but then we'll have that next level of conversation. Then they're a little more open to it. And, and you know, so I, I know things had to get really bad for me in order for me to even want sobriety, you know. Um, so some things definitely had to change when the fear of changing became less than the fear of staying the same. Um, that's when when things, you know changed gears and, and being willing to listen to people. Cause I felt like, you know, I was very treatment savvy. I had all the things figured out. I could recite the, the matrix model and all those different books, but when it came to applying the stuff in my life and living life, I had no clue how to do it. So, um, yeah, just, we're very patient with, with our clients and, and where they're, so, um, if they don't complete the goal they had last week, you know, it's like, okay, you know, um, is that something you could achieve this week? Because some things come up for them that are very challenging too. And, um, you know, life happens whether we're sober or not. So um, we're there for them through the thick and thin. And it's really cool. So let it pass. Great. Thank you very much. That really gives um, the people on here this evening an, an idea of what, you know, the work that we're doing here <clears throat> and what our peer what our peer recovery folks are doing out there to help um, those people that are in those early stages, you know, and, and what, how do we, how do we help them figure out how to be productive, right, for themselves, you know, that's, that's a great place to start. So um, we've talked a little bit about how to help um, some of the resources available for family. We've talked a little bit about, you know, how to help people that actually in, uh, in early recovery. And I think, what I want to talk about for this last little bit, and we'll maybe get some questions and answers here at the end, but I think, um, you know, it's really important to start thinking about and talking about, you know, in our community, we have people that are doing their best to try to be productive members of society, right? And they're faced with, with stigma. You know, I know that when I, um, 
very early in, in my recovery when I was trying to decide where to try to work, right? Like, who am I going to put my job applications into? Where do I send my resume? And that was really, really challenging because I know what was going to show up on my record, you know? And if I don't have a chance to talk to somebody and explain, you know, hey, yes, that is a part of my past. This is part of my history. I'd love to talk with you about, you know, how that happened and where I'm at now and how I've been able to move past that. You know, if I don't get that opportunity, if all somebody does is look at my record, you know, there's there's a lot of stigma attached to those things that are going to show up for folks. And, um, you know, what can we do as a community to really start addressing those stigmas and not just the stigmas, but like those biases. Um, you know, we talk about, oh, I need to move through this quickly before we talk about that. I'm sorry, I forgot about these couple of slides. These are um, things, did somebody comment? Nope. Okay. So these are things when we talk about family members um, and what they're able to do to help somebody that's in the the disease of, of addiction, if they're actively in that disease, or even if they're in recovery, it's really important to kind of keep this circle in mind and, and understand that um, here's the things that I'm able to control right here in the middle, right? And here's a bunch of other stuff in this outside circle that are things I can't control. Um, you know, somebody's actions and words are not something I can control. So when we think about that person that's in early recovery, you know, they're struggling with things and maybe they're having a post-acute withdrawal day and they've been really short-tempered and they've been, you know, hard to be around that day. You know, really, um, like we talked about earlier, education, right? If we know and we've been able to build our supports up in a way that say, I need to leave that person where they're at today, I can't control what they're saying. I can't control what they're feeling. All I can do is control my reaction to it. You know, so if I learn to walk away from those situations before they escalate, maybe I can leave that person where they're at to sort through that themselves. And maybe the next time they have a better way to get through it than me trying to step in and take care of it for them. So that's one of the things that this uh, this kind of helps us remember um, that there are some things that I just need to remember aren't in my circle. <laughs> um, and this one <clears throat> is kind of that same thing. There are things uh, that we can do things doing for other people, right? Like there's a space that we can do things for other people that's healthy, right? We can help them. Like Drew was talking about, we can help them make goals. We can help them, you know, find the steps they need to achieve those goals. But somewhere, if we're not careful in that circle of doing things for other people, we can move into that enabling side, right? And how easy is that to do when we see somebody that's actually trying and they're having a hard time and they're struggling, we want to step in and help them in a way that helps them get that goal that maybe if we'd have left them to figure out on their own how to get that goal, it would have been better for them. I think that falls into that uh, codependency thing Drew was talking about a little bit there. So um, we're happy to share these slides and some of this if, if somebody would like uh, a copy of those circles to kind of remember where and how to to, to, to leave things, sometimes we'd be happy to do that. The dimensions of wellness, these are really important for people in recovery and for people dealing with people in recovery. Actually, I'm gonna take that back and I'm gonna say, these are just really good for people in general. <laughs> and that as human beings, if we're able to put a little bit of effort into these eight different dimensions, um, we're really able to kind of have a, a little, uh, what we would consider maybe a full life, right? Like we've managed to incorporate a lot of the things that we need if we're able to focus on these dimensions at different times. Um, I think in particular for uh, people in recovery or for people dealing with somebody in recovery, the emotional, social, spiritual, you know, those are really, really important for folks. Um, Again, these are great resources and we can share them with you. Um, if anybody's interested, please put something in the chat. We'd love to, to get that information out to folks. But the thing I really wanna talk about before we finish up this evening is we've talked about um, you know what to do for that specific family member. We've talked about what to do uh, you know, when we're helping somebody on a professional level, like from our peer recovery coaches, what they're able to do to help people. But what is it that we are able to do just as general 
community members, right? Um, what can we do to help lessen stigma and to maybe help some of our folks that are in recovery feel more comfortable in their in these in these spaces, right? Um, I know one of the things that I learned really early on with my family was that we didn't have very many family events that didn't have alcohol. Um, you know, and what a what a challenge that was to to find a way to still see the family that I loved, right? Um, especially the ones that were normies, right? Those ones that that were able to have a drink or two, and that was all they ever had, and and you know. Um, how do we have that family event where we're maybe making it safe for that person in recovery or trying to help them feel safe in that event, but also not, um, you know, what would feel like punishing, right, the other family members that maybe weren't struggling with those issues? And what's that good middle ground where we're being supportive, but we're not enabling and we're not um, alienating some of the other family members? So, uh the interesting thing about that is that when we are able to find those good spaces that are comfortable for everyone, we're actually working on stigma, right? Like if we're able to find a, a way to hold an event where the expectation isn't always that there's going to be alcohol there, right? We're, we're making some of those community-wide, those environmental changes that go a long way to not just helping somebody in recovery, but maybe even helping um, present a good community norm for some of our young people that maybe even aren't struggling yet. Um, so these things are all kind of tied together and work um, in ways that we have to find good spaces for all those things, right? We need the good support. We need the good community events. We need the, the good family events. We, we have to have all these things if we're truly going to address what some of the underlying and causational, <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a word, but I made it up. Um, some of the causational things <laughs> for, um, you know, some of those relapse that, that relapses that Drew and, and Sam were talking about, right? Like if we as a community are able to think outside the box a little bit, maybe we can find some safer spaces for some of our folks that maybe we didn't even realize were in recovery right? Some people don't share it. The people that are here on this call today, we obviously have no problem talking about that part of our lives. This is something that, you know, we've come to terms with in a way that we're able to work through it very publicly, but not everybody's able to do that. And so what can we do just as community members to help improve and make good safe spaces for everybody to, to kind of engage in some of our events? So make it kid friendly. A lot of people will recognize the fact that if it's a kid-friendly event, they're probably not going to bring alcohol with them, right? And so that can go a long way. Um, not everybody, obviously, is going to, to feel that way, but um, most people and most events that are kid-friendly are going to have a limited amount of alcohol. So that can be one way to help kind of promote um activities or events that, that maybe aren't centered around alcohol. Plan morning or, e or early afternoon events. Again, not that this applies to everybody, <laughs> but especially social drinkers, um, they're, they're not very often having drinks early in the day at an event. Um, it's not as expected at that time of day as it is, say, in an evening event for there to be alcohol. Um, so, having lots of activities planned at an event. So if you do have an evening event, um, you know, where there's probably going to be alcohol that's kind of expected, you know, uh, that's probably what's gonna be happening there. If there's lots of other activities planned at an event, it can really give somebody that's in recovery an avenue to still be engaged with the party, but not necessarily having to say, oh no, I'm, I'm not drinking anymore, or, you know, no, I don't wanna do that. They can, you know, oh no, actually I'm gonna go get engaged in this, game of twister, you know, over, over in the other room, or I'm actually participating in, you know, this event that the host was having. And it gives people something to do other than just stand around without a drink in their hand, right? Um, and that's a way to do that where we're not alienating anybody, but we're giving an out in case somebody does show up that needs that, that, uh, that reason to not have a drink in their hand. 
Make it a bring your own beverage. If everybody's responsible for bringing themselves something to drink, some people won't spend the money on alcohol <laughs> just because if they're getting it for free, they'll drink it. But if they've got to pay for it, sometimes they won't. <laughs> um, that's another one of those normie things. Uh, <laughs> so um, that can actually, and it, it, again, it gives somebody an excuse. If, if it's bring your own beverage and somebody's there drinking a root beer, they can say, oh, no, I just brought this because it's my favorite one, or this is the one my kid likes. So I brought it with me. And you know, so again, those easy outs for people that maybe are in recovery that we don't even know. If we know specifically that there is somebody that's coming to our party that we know we're going to have alcohol at, right? But we know somebody in recovery is coming. What are the things that we can do as a host to help that person feel more comfortable? Don't drink. Be one of the people that's not drinking at the event so that that person that you invited maybe feels comfortable enough to come sit and talk with you for a little bit, right? There's somebody there that they know that they're able to communicate with. So maybe they don't feel quite as outside as they would have if um, they didn't know anybody that did, wasn't drinking at the time. Um, have your, your event at a venue that doesn't have alcohol. That's a good way to, oh, there's no alcohol at this wedding. Nope, this was my favorite place out of all the venues we picked. And it was the one that didn't allow us to have alcohol, you know? So again, really good ways to help us kind of start to reduce that, that community norm that alcohol is the only way to, to have a party, right? Um, goes a long way towards stigma. Um, breaking stigmas goes a long way to helping people feel more comfortable in those spaces. I said a lot really quickly there. We've only got a few minutes left. I will ask um, our panel of recovery coaches very quickly. Is there anything you'd like to add before we um, wrap up for the evening? Yeah, this is Jill. Um, I'd, I'd also like to add to be understanding if you have a family member that just chooses not to participate in, um, in an event um, because they're not comfortable being around alcohol yet. Uh, one of the, I, I avoided uh, family gatherings for a little while because I, you know, it wasn't necessarily, I, I didn't want to ask my family to not partake in alcohol because they're not alcoholics and I am an alcoholic. So uh, my mom, she struggles with overbearingness. And so she had a hard time accepting that I, I wasn't coming because there was going to be alcohol there and I'm just not comfortable yet. So just being understanding, I think is important. I just like to say that all of my family events um, when I was in early recovery, they all became recovery friendly as soon as I got in recovery because I was the only person bringing alcohol to the family events and gatherings. <laughs> Nobody else drank. So they all got recovery friendly as soon as Sam got in recovery. So, <laughs> so that was a good thing for my family and they all appreciated it. Um, and, you know, after I had about a year sober, I would go into AA meetings and I used to uh, invite people from the meetings to my home that didn't have a place to go for the holidays because there are a lot of people that are alone and they're suffering in silence and uh, so you know I used to open up my home and ask them I, I cooked for 30 or 40 people for like two years in a row for Thanksgiving and Christmas and I had a house full of people in early recovery and nobody was drinking and we all had a good time and uh, I remember it and that was a long time ago and I'd like to get back and, and do that again. So uh, to give back to people that gave it to me. Well, thank you. And thanks for inviting us to this today. I've unmuted Melissa. Um, she's actually going to tell us a little bit about one of the projects that she has going here at the agency. Hi, I'm Melissa. I am an outpatient counselor here at 180. Um, I also do various other things here. Um, and one of the other things that I do is um, I run a support group called Embracing Resiliency. Um, it is for family members or people who have loved ones that are struggling with addiction um, or in recovery themselves. Um, as we've talked about a lot today, it is a, it's, it can be a wild ride of, um, going through many different emotions, um, and here's the information about it. Um, and 
we're not meant to go through this life alone. So this, this is a space where um, it is not a counseling session and it is not a therapy group and it's not an Al-Anon group. So it is completely free for the community. Anyone is welcome to join. You do not need to call ahead. You can just show up. Um, and this is just a space where you can connect with other people who are going through something similar as you. Um, again, there's no cost, no registration. You can show up once. And if you don't like that, it's okay. And it's just a spot where you can start to get get help for yourself. Because like Dr. Labor said, um, there's not really much you can control in the situation when it comes to your loved one or um, your family member, but you can you can help yourself um, and get support for yourself. Thank you very much. Are you guys getting that feedback? Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe I'm the only one that can hear it. <laughs> All right, so questions. Is there any questions anybody has that we can answer? Please put that in the chat. Uh, we'll keep an eye out for that. Um, anybody else uh, have anything they'd like to chime in with before we talk about our next event, which is September 30th. This will be at Wayne College. And um, we are going to have a panel from around the county talking about substance use in our, uh, in our community. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about alcohol. Uh, we're going to hear from, because we, we know actually our young people are using alcohol more than they're using um, most other substances uh, pretty consistently. That's, that's the answer we get. But um, that'll be happening on the 30th. And uh, there will be a link if you're unable to attend in person. But I will say, if you attend in person, we're going to have some fantastic food from the family apron uh, there that evening. We'd love to provide dinner for you folks if you're able to come out and um, help us at that event, help us participate in that event as well. All right, I'm seeing lots of thank yous in the chat and we are very, very happy to have had this conversation this evening and we look forward to having more of them. So keep an eye out on our social medias for our, um, for our next event in this three-part series. It'll be our last one at the end of, April, at the end of September, celebrating Recovery Month. Um, if you get a chance, uh, share some of our Recovery Month things from our social medias. We'd love to, again, help reduce some of that stigma and really make this, uh, you know, this a safe space for our folks that are in recovery to find some, some, some good, healthy ways to enjoy um, a celebration about recovery this month. So, again, uh, the video, oh, put in the chat, fantastic. This video is going to be posted on our website. So if you know somebody that might actually benefit from this information but wasn't able to be here tonight, um, please visit uh, 180 uh, and we'd uh, love to get it shared um, with everybody. All right, thank you folks so very much. <laughs>